it's the Everett Bone and Joint uh, uh, Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable. Uh, joining us right now, Dr. John Pryor, Dr. Todd Havener, Dr. Jeff Mason, and um, we're waiting on uh, Dr. Wertheimer, Dr. Barker, Haller, Kinahan, Wong, Nowak. Um, we're waiting for all of them to show up. We're just getting started early with uh, the, the, the three early arrivals. With the so A-team. The yeah. A-team, that's right. The it's, A-team. Uh, it's the it's, brain trust. It's going to be pretty cool. If you, have, uh, if you have questions that you've always wanted to ask a surgeon, maybe you're at home and your knee's bothering you and you haven't been to the doctor yet and you want to just get uh, free advice without any copay, you can uh, give us a call at 425-304-1380 or you can go to uh, the uh, Integrated Rehabilitation Group Facebook page at Facebook slash Integrated Rehabilitation Group. So uh, let's kick things off. Let's talk about a little fantasy football, a little football injury that we normally do. If you guys want to fill in, I, I want to lead off here because I drafted, I play fantasy football, and I drafted Antonio Gates, and uh, he has plantar fasciitis. And, you know, I was in the shoe business for 25 years. I've seen plantar fasciitis. He played one game, and he, he's been out the last two is plantar fasciitis. Is that something that he's going to be able to uh, play this year? Is it is it easily, you know, not resting on it? Does that make it better? It's not particularly easy to treat. It's something that you can have a you can have it a little or you can have it a lot. Um, when patients appear in our office with this, we typically tell them there's going to be a six month ordeal. Um, stretching exercises have been shown to be more reliable than any other form of treatment. But like many difficult-to-treat conditions, uh, people try injections, they try physical therapy, they try even surgery, they try modifications in footwear, and all of these are successful a substantial percentage of the time. If you stretch it out and rest it long enough, it's likely to go away. But if he's in your fantasy team, I would get rid of him. Well, let's, let's back up here real quick, guys. Let's talk about anatomically what is the problem with plantar fasciitis and, and what tissue are we dealing with, and why is it so difficult, I mean, particularly when you're talking about an elite athlete that's running and jumping. Tell us anatomically about that tissue. Well, the plantar fascia is a sheet of tissue that originates uh, sort of on the front of the heel bone and goes out to the uh, metatarsal heads. And typically when it gets irritated or injured, you have micro-tearing of the fascia, typically where it originates in the, uh, the heel bone, and... It's very hard to, it doesn't have a great blood supply, so it's hard to make it heal. And it tends to become irritated by even normal activity. Um, and so for people who are trying to run and jump, it can be very painful and persistently painful. So when you're talking, when we're talking about fascia, we're not talking about uh, tendons or muscles. We're talking about connective tissue. Yeah, it's a thick band of, of tissue that's, that's organized somewhat like a tendon, but it's typically sort of flat and covers a distance, but it's, it's connecting into two bony structures in this case. So just joining us and coming in, more. you want to go ahead and introduce Yeah, uh, joining us is uh, Dr. Barker and Dr. Wertheimer. Dr. Barker, you're the, uh, the authority on plantar fasciitis, are you not? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we were talking about the, the, uh, the uh, Antonio Gates of the Chargers who uh, has plantar fasciitis. He played a game. He's rested the last couple of games. My question was... Do I hang on to him? Is he going to be able to play? Oh, get rid of him. Get rid of him? <laughs> yeah. If Maybe I'll try to trade him. This, trade him. Yeah. Okay. Tell somebody else that he'll be fine because it's just heel pain, but otherwise, get rid of him. <laughs> and he had this towards the end of last year, too. It takes, on average, nine months to get rid of him. Unbelievable. Dr. Wow. Wertheimer said some personal experience with him. You've, you've had it? Yeah. Dr. Parker well, has personally injected my plantar fasciitis. <laughs> oh. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you get plantar fasciitis, Clay? Was it playing, an I was playing basketball in uh, Hoop Fest with oh. my boys, and uh, we actually made it to the second round. We went deep. Went deep. And it was a little, <laughs> little too much for my poor little plantar fasciitis yeah. to handle, and I got the wickedest case of plantar fasciitis, and it lasted about a year. So generally speaking, it is related to activity overuse too much too soon, um, why don't you kind of cover Getting that? Old. Being on your feet on concrete, I've had it twice. Almost everybody you know has at least had it once. Um, it's just life. Maury, this is the one thing. I, I've he's never over, had it. He's over there shaking his but, head. But, you know, like I said, I was, I was in the shoe business for 25 years. I think I've caused it a lot, actually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> selling selling improper fitting footwear. But how about the, the rolling your foot on a golf ball? 
that ha- hasn't been shown to really make a difference. Okay. So the things that help it are stretches, night splints, more stretches, uh, and cushions. Okay. Well, and sometimes what about just decreasing or stopping that activity Absolutely. and rest? Absolutely. And Antonio Gates, unfortunately, he's a guy that, I mean, he's a pretty large man, I would imagine, and since he's a tight yeah. end, he's running and jumping. So chances are he's going to be out for, uh, what, I mean, would you say another three to four weeks at least? Or just play with pain. Or play with pain. Good point, yeah. So who else, Maury? What else do we have? We have another injury. Here. Well, you know, we have other injuries, but we actually we have a phone call. Oh, we have great, uh, right. questions. This is a big-time show. You know, people, yeah. people yeah. Uh, you don't get the opportunity to have doctors just hanging out ready to take calls. So uh, we're going to go to Gracie is on the phone right now. Gracie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Hey, Gracie, how are you doing? Shannon O'Kelly Good. here. Hi, Shannon. How are you? I'm doing great. What's, what, what, what's going on? So I have a question for Dr. Barker. I sit at a desk all day, and I really like to wear cute high heels. Am I setting myself up for arthritis later in life? Well, what you're setting yourself up for is forefoot pain or metatarsalgia, and then when you fall off that cute high heel, you're setting yourself up for a fracture. (laughs) So I've just had a really good fracture on a lady falling off a four-inch heel. But she looked good going down, didn't she? She must have. (laughs) Yeah. So here's here's the deal. Let's talk about um, high heels and... And when you say forefoot, you're essentially trying to jam your toes into this narrow toe box, which is not real good for the bones and ligaments and tissues. Right. And then you're putting most of your weight on just the front of your foot as well, just underneath your toes. So metatarsalgia, that's a big word. So why don't you break it down for us and tell, tell us what that means. It's the ball of your foot, pain underneath the ball of your foot from standing on those little bones down there instead of spreading the pressure out over everything. Is it one area of the, uh, of the ball of the foot? Is it more underneath the big toe or is it the second toe is just across the bottom? Uh, a lot of times it's two and three. Two and three, so the second and third toe. Yep. And, what, and what's the reason for that? Is it just uh, the anatomy of the toe there? It, um, the second toe is often the longest toe, and it's often the longest second, uh, longest metatarsal, and so you put more pressure as you roll off. People with metatarsalgia commonly are very tight in their gastroc or in their Achilles, and so stretching that helps a lot. Howard, is uh, Gracie setting herself up yeah. for a bunion? Yes. She is setting herself up for a bunion for sure. You feel pretty good about yourself, don't you, Gracie? But <laughs> that's all right. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, Gracie, we have, we have ways to fix bunions, so you keep wearing those shoes. Gracie, do you mind if I ask you how old you are? Yeah, I'm 25. Yeah, okay. Come on, wear the high heels. You can worry about the bunions. You know, by the time you're by the time you're older and have bunions, technology will catch up. It'll be no big deal, right? Are are flats just as bad though because you're completely flat-footed? They are not. Um, when you put yourself into a heel, you're forcing your toes down into the little toe box, like Shannon said. And so none of those forefoots are actually, or the, the shoes are sized the way your foot is. If you draw the outline of that shoe on the ground and then put your foot over the top of it, you'll see that your foot actually doesn't fit in that shoe unless Maury crams it in. Okay. For the extra two hundred and seventy-five dollars. So here's the deal. Speaking of that, there's a brand. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Taryn Rose. Have you ever heard of Taryn Rose? Yes. She makes a ton of money. Yeah, she makes yeah. a ton of money. Gracie, listen to me. Taryn Rose shoes. They're stylish, and and I believe she's a foot doctor, she's right? An orthopedic surgeon. She's an orthopedic surgeon. She makes really nice looking shoes that are very comfortable, and they're good All for right. you. Well, yeah. hang, hang on, before we, before we, let, Rose. If we let Grace They're go, a little bit expensive. If she likes to wear those shoes at work and during the day, what should she do? Is there anything she can do in the evening to kind of reverse that, the, jamming those, that forefoot in that small toe box we talk about? It depends if she wants to have a bunion or not. So if she wants a bunion, keep wearing them all night, all day. <laughs> um, otherwise, you need to just rest the tissue. Okay. Gracie, thanks a lot for your call. We got to take a break. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Gracie. We got to take a quick break. We're going to come back. It's uh, whoa, you're just getting warmed up. It's the Everett Bone and Joint uh, Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable on Fox Sports 1380 Integrated Rehabilitation Group Health Matters. We'll be right back right after this. All right, welcome back to uh, Integrated Rehabilitation Group Health Matters. The special edition Everett Bone and Joint Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable. We got the full group in. Shannon, we had two introduce them. Just, uh, recently. Let me yep. just take an opportunity here to introduce everybody. To my right, and going around the table, is Dr. John Pryor. Uh, Dr. Pryor's special area of interest is spine surgery, particularly minimally invasive surgery. Next to him is Dr. Havner, hand surgeon. Dr. Barker, 
foot and ankle fellowship, Dr. Mason, arthroscopy, shoulders and knees, Dr. Clay Wertheimer, sports medicine, arthroscopy, shoulders, knees, ankles, and elbows. This is pretty cool, yeah. actually, when yeah, you think about it. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? It's great. It's when great. has this ever happened? Uh, well, last year we had the card table. We did have the card and table. And now we have the round table. Yeah. So. I remember the first year, um, my fantastic question was, what kind of music do you guys listen to yeah. <laughs> when you're doing surgery? And uh, I can't remember. One of you said, like, some of C- some crazy heavy metal stuff. Was yeah, that I you? Know, I don't know who that is. Was that? <laughs> what do you listen to, Doc? Dr. Havener? Rammstein. Rammstein. Yeah, Rammstein. Yeah, Rammstein. Yeah. yeah. The relaxing stuff. Yeah, so, so uh, anyways, let's go. We have another phone call. This is a big-time show. A lot of people are calling. Let's go to Ron and Lake Stevens. Are you there, Ron? I'm here. All right, ask your question, bud. Uh, I read Peyton Manning's neck injury could ha- hamper him later in life and cause degenerative use of his cervical spine. Um, what does that mean, and what would be the symptoms? Dr. That's Pryor. Uh, that's a great question. Um, he sort of just review what he had done. He had a fusion done of one of the levels of his cervical spine. So two of the bones that moved independently are now joined together with the plate and screws and bone grows in between them. Um, There remains to be seen how he'll do with time. In general, people do very, very well from this, but uh, potentially that could put more stress on a level above or a level below that in his neck and cause him problems in the future. And and the reason reason he had to have this surgery that you know of based on... um, just his history and symptoms, uh, what was that? Yeah, he had a, uh, a pinched nerve in his neck. So the squishy shock absorbers in between the, the bones in his neck um, called discs, a piece of that had squirted out essentially and into an area where the nerves exit and go down your arm and you know make your muscles work, give you feeling, and if they get pressure on them, they, they hurt can give you weakness and things like that. And he had that going on. They attempted, uh, this is the third surgery they've attempted to, to make that better in him. So essentially what, Ron, I, what I want, want to get you to understand is why do they fuse the neck and what is the rationale behind fusing that segment that's got that impaired squishy tissue, if you will? Yeah, once that, once that disc has been injured, it can continue to, to cause pain and, and collapse there. If you were to just remove the disc and not... Uh, uh, fuse it, put a spacer in there to kind of hold it in the proper position and fuse it together, it can go on to continue to cause problems. John, wasn't that uh, disc, uh, when it squishes on the nerve, that nerve is kind of a like a coaxial cable, like what goes in your TV. It has a lot of different things in it, and one of the things it has in it is the, the signals to the muscles for strength. Mm-hmm. So potentially, he Manning was weaker, right? He, yeah, he couldn't throw as hard. Yeah, there's been a lot of news reports that he has some um, weakness in his tricep, so the the muscle that makes you straighten out your elbow, which is, can be pretty important for throwing. Um, uh, that, that's from a particular nerve root in your neck that carries down uh, the signals to make that muscle work. Um, and if he does indeed have that weakness, we'll have to see if that strength comes back. But very commonly, it will come but back. But surgically, it's like important to scrape out that disc so yeah, it's not the, squishing the nerve, so it's not making you weak and painful. Right, exactly. Get the pressure off the nerves. In addition to making it not hurt in the area where that nerve goes anymore, it makes the muscle work better again. And I, I think people need to understand, just describe that type of nerve tissue. When you talk about nerve tissue, it is extremely sensitive. And any kind of pressure on that tissue will result in symptoms down in your arms or if it's in your low back in your legs? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, nerves don't take a joke very well. I, uh, yeah, that's, they, good. They, that's a good they, point. They don't like to be insulted. They don't like to be pushed around. Um, and uh, they let you know when this happening for sure. And usually in the form of pain or numbness and sometimes weakness. Hey, Ron, are you still there? Yeah, I am. So did you have any other uh, questions regarding um, cervical fusion or... I mean, personally, do you have an experience or have had an experience or a question regarding your neck? Well, I, I, I work on the computer a lot, and I notice that over time that I, I, I get numbness in my fingers, and it's kind of like weakness of the arm just being in that mouse position. So is, is, is that similar to what, what he's going on? I mean, I'm not getting tackled in my chair or anything, but sometimes it feels like it. Well, it could be. If there's some narrowing around the nerves and staying in a particular position for a long time uh, keeps pressure on them and causes that pain or weakness. But it could also be coming, the nerves leave your neck, go down your arm, and there are multiple places down your arm where uh, there can be pressure in your nerves uh, as well. Something like carpal tunnel syndrome 
uh, where there's pressure on the, the nerves in a different area. Well, we're seeing a lot of this um, in today's world, particularly since we live in a society where we're fairly sedentary, and there's so much. We're in a, a high-technology area, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. And in physical therapy, we see a lot of patients that sit like you do, Ron, all day long, looking at your computer screen. Your head gets forward. Your shoulders get rounded. Your, your back becomes somewhat C-shaped. And what Dr. Pryor is talking about is you can entrap nerves going down in your arms and cause that tingling. What you need to do is you need to kind of reverse that posture and sit upright. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah, yeah I think that's a good point. Yeah. It, it actually turns out that what your mother told you was true, that you should sit up straight. Sit up yeah. straight. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Todd, is there any relationship uh, between carpal tunnel syndrome and using a keyboard or using stuff at your desk or using a mouse? Has there been any scientific proof that there's a relationship there? Lately, the uh, you know, in the past, uh, carpal tunnel and, and keyboarding was thought to be related in uh, more of the... Um, you know, the push in medicine is, is uh, looking for evidence-based medicine, and, and most of the studies now are showing that there isn't a relationship between carpal tunnel syndrome and keyboarding. And, um, but there's a lot to be said about your wrist position and things like that. It may not actually be the keyboarding that's doing it. It's probably more the position of your wrist and then, I think, uh, metabolic uh, problems as we get older. How about with like prolonged gripping or grabbing something? I mean, I, it seems to me I remember from my training that the first medical reports of carpal tunnel syndrome were in butchers, uh, people that held knives all day, and uh, they noticed this syndrome of meat carvers, and uh, it it turned out that that was one of the first reports of carpal tunnel syndrome, like in the 20s and 30s. Is there a relationship there? There. Um I, I still don't think there's been evidence that's huh. really shown that out. Yeah. It's interesting. Because yeah. I've heard, like, dental hygienists and electricians, people that do a lot of It's, it's kind of crimping. Um, right. That sort right. of thing does. Um, hey, hey, Ron, do you, I mean, just out of curiosity, you say you work on a computer. Do you um, have it more on your right side or left side? And do you mouse on the right side or do you switch? I mean, tell us a little bit about your ergonomic environment. Well, it's, it's always on the right side because I'm okay. right-handed. And uh, it's kind of a big mouse, so I've always got a grip on it. And I've noticed it's felt a lot better with the touch screens. They've got those new computers out that have the, the touch screens that you can work with your finger on the screen itself. So uh, Dr. Todd Havener, the hand surgeon, is going to talk to you about um, kind of what's going on there possibly. Yeah, you know, it's probably the, the pressure that, I mean, if you're using the mouse only with the one hand, um, you know, as you're resting your hand, it uh, does put more pressure on the, the carpal canal. And so typically I, I have my patients uh, switch hands uh, in terms of using the mouse, you know, a while with the right, a while with the left. Um, and uh, and try to change, make sure your, your height of your chair is correct, you know, keyboard's in a good position, monitor and all that. Now, we're, we're talking about this carpal tunnel. Now, if I'm driving down the road out there, and I'm going, what is a carpal tunnel? What are they talking about? So well, the carpal tunnel is the area of your wrist where the uh, your nerve, the median nerve, which gives you sensation to your thumb and your uh, pointer finger and your, your bird finger. A bird uh, finger. A bird <laughs> finger. Uh, gives you sensation of those. So when it's compressed at the level of the wrist, it uh, gives you numbness, tingling, usually an achiness, and, you know, sometimes uh, trouble with coordination. Oftentimes occurs uh, driving, like you said, mostly at night. You know, that's a very common symptom is uh, at you, nighttime. I was, I was just curious, Ron, do you have night pain or is it just, again, at your computer? Uh, it's after kind of working for a few hours. And, and, and so if you get up and move around and get out of that position, does that pain, numbness and tingling, go away? A little bit. It's mainly if I take a day or a couple of days off that it alleviates the symptoms. Yeah. Do you do you ever wake up uh, at night with your hands numb or anything like that at all? Uh, sometimes, yes. Yeah. Ron, thanks a lot for your call. We have a, we have another call, but I have a quick okay. question for you. Are you seeing more uh, carpal tunnel now than say ten years ago? You know, as far as the computer, everybody's on the computer more now than. You know, I wasn't in practice ten years. Ago. Uh, okay, <laughs> he's young. <laughs> but if what you're saying is true, that there's really no relationship. Yeah, then then no, it's right? Sort of to me, is there a role for an ergonomic keyboard? I mean, do you? Well, I think there is. I think there's. I think that's a, a huge uh, role. And in, in uh, most of my patients, you know, I, I always uh, suggest ergonomic assessment of their workstation. Mm -hmm. And typically, uh, simple changes in just even chair. 
you know, different mounts, those sort of things, and then, uh, you know, getting their uh, their their sort of back stabilizers position wise, uh-huh. like, like um, um, Shannon. You know, Shannon was talking yeah. about with, uh, you know, getting out of that C shape, it usually makes them better. Let's take another call. Let's go to Joel in Marysville's on the phone for us. Joel, are you there? I am. All right, go ahead. Ask your question. I play soccer uh, once a week, and I've got just a nagging uh, pain in my Achilles. And it uh, will go away after a couple of days after I play. But I'm wondering if there's anything I can do to help that go away faster. I work construction, and so it, it's annoying at work to be hobbling around for a couple of days, whether it's stretching or ice or if you have any recommendations. Yeah, the recommendations are be very patient. Uh, but is the pain right where the Achilles hooks into your heel? Yes, it is. So that condition is called Achilles tendinosis. It's not truly an inflammation. It's more of a degeneration of your tendon there. Okay. Uh, and it takes a long time to get better. Occasionally, there's a bone spur that's actually sticking up in that part of the tendon, and it can be helped with surgery. But most of the time, we try to avoid that. The keys to making it happy during the day is to use a heel wedge in your shoe at work so that it actually shortens the tendon as well as doing stretching exercises. Are you having any type of morning pain when you get out of bed? Oh, yeah. Plenty. All right. So a night splint is a real cheap, real easy way to make you feel lots better. And you can get them online for about 40 bucks if you just Google posterior night splint. Um, and that will really help you keep that stretch during the night, and when you get up in the morning, it won't hurt as much. Nice. Could I say one more thing? Yeah. I had uh, I came in and saw Dr. Wertheimer and for a knee injury I had in soccer, and uh, when he found out I didn't have insurance, he wanted to do an MRI. He wanted to take a look at it, but uh, when he found out I didn't have insurance, he said, you know what? Save your $1,500, give it three or four weeks, and see what happens. If it's still bad, come back and see me. And uh, four weeks later, I was back playing and felt great. And so I wanted to thank him for the good advice and, and for saving me money. He's the man. He's the man. Joel, thanks for your call. Thanks, Joel. You bet. All right, stick around. This is the. Uh, this is awesome, huh? I, uh, it's the Everett Bona Joint Roundtable. Uh, all you knee people, stick around. It's time. We're talking knees next on the IRG Health Matters ever bone a joint round table on Fox Sports 1380. We are back. It's uh, IRG Health Matters. It's the ever bone and joint uh, orthopedic surgeon round table. We're having a really good time and a uh, lot of great information. Let's go. We have a phone call. Let's go. Uh, it's kind of cool taking phone calls, huh? Shannon is on the phone from Bothell. Shannon, how are you? I am well, thanks. How are you? Good, thanks. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, I have a question. Um, my son grew about four inches in a year, and I have a, I, I'm curious as far as growing pains versus overuse it, uh, aches and pains, and, and how, do, how do I know the difference? Wow, that's a great question. Well, which one of you gentlemen want? Before we, before we answer, let's just real quick. We have a new with introduction. Yeah, we have, have a new morning. member of the band is here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Doug Dr. Nowak is joining us along with Dr. Clay Wertheimer, Dr. Howard Barker, Dr. John Pryor, Dr. Todd Havener, and Dr. Jeff Mason. It's the uh, it's the guys from Everett Bone and Joint are joining us. So we have a young man who grew four inches and in how how much and how fast, Shannon? Uh, with within probably nine months. Shannon, I'll, I'll start off on that. Uh, it's Dr. Wertheimer. I think one of the uh, keys to that is that, uh, one, I think there is such a thing as growing pain, that these kids can grow so fast, their bones grow faster than the soft tissues. And typically and characteristically of growing pains in kids, they'll complain of it at night. Okay. Whereas if your kid is, you know, really into particularly a single sport or you're concerned that, man, he's doing a lot of this sports activity and it's overuse, he's going to have pain after use. Okay. So the timing of that pain will give you a clue as to whether he's having pain due to growing pain or whether he's having pain due to overuse. And then the other thing, obviously, is when he stops growing, the pains will stop. But if he's continuing to overuse his knees or whatever, Mm -hmm. the pains won't stop as his growth spurt uh, slows down. Um, So that's another 
uh, key. The other thing is I would trust your intuition. If you're a little bit concerned that your child is overusing something or his coach is making him throw too many pitches, or um, you know, I would follow that intuition and, and have a discussion with uh, both your child and, and with the coaches or the, the group that he works with and maybe overusing those extremities with. Okay. Shannon, what, um, what area or part of the body did you say are you mostly concerned or hear the, the most complaints from your son? Um, ongoing and after that initial growth spurt, it's been the knees. Okay, so, gentlemen, let's talk about some of these growth issues in the knee. And one of the things I can kind of comes to my mind is apophysitis or uh, tibial tubercle uh, Osgood, if you want to. Osgood slaughter. Yeah, Osgood syndrome, slaughter yes. syndrome. Why don't you talk about that, Jeff? Well, how old is your son? Uh, he is uh, 15 right now. So at 15, that's more often than not a little bit on the older side than we typically see Osgood Schlatter's. Normally, we see it a few years younger than that. So um, in a case like this, you can still have, uh, you know, the apophysitis sort of thing where there's excessive pressure being put on the growth plate just below the knee by the pressure of uh, the patellar tendon. And so you see a lot of it in people who are playing a lot of running and jumping sports, whether it's soccer or basketball. And um, it's one of these conditions that uh, typically it's, it's self-limiting. It can be irritating, but if people reduce their activity a little bit, use ice and judicious use of anti-inflammatories, it can be controlled. There are uncommon cases where it can be a lot worse, and you can even have fractures in that area. We see that very rarely, but on, you know, on the odd occasion it can happen. So it is tough to get kids when they're very involved in these sports, and the last thing they want to do is stop. And even if they're fairly miserable, they'll have a tendency to – you know, suck it up and want to continue to participate. That's so one of the things that, that you, you're we're talking about, and just you guys, a lot of times these kids just don't have time to stop. I mean, we have kids doing multiple activities. I mean, they're playing select school, et cetera, et cetera. So they do need some rest sometimes just to let this, this calm right. down. You know, Shannon's question makes me think of two things, too, Shannon. Yeah. Um, one is that don't ignore night pain in children. I mean, it's well and good to get advice over the radio, but if you are concerned about your child, particularly if your child is waking up at night with pain, take them in to see a physician. Get them checked out because it may be growing pain, yeah, and growing pains often occur at night, uh, but it may be something else that's more serious that really deserves to be looked at by a professional. So don't ignore that, uh, that symptom at all. And, um, you know, like I said before, follow your your intuition. If you have a concern about um, your child being overplayed or over-exercised, that's a justifiable concern. And we're seeing that more and more, uh, particularly as younger kids, younger athletes are, are playing their sport all year long. And um, really from a sports medicine standpoint, that is not healthy. You should encourage your kids as they're developing and as they're growing up to play different sports, to work different sets of muscles, learn different skills that they can use as an adult. Because, you know, let's face it, it's going to be only a very small percentage of those kids that are going to go on to a professional career. Mm -hmm. You want your kid to be healthy and happy and have some skills as an adult so he can continue to enjoy sports. Good we point. hear that a lot. We hear yeah. that, you know, almost every, every show, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a well. There's what, what, remember we we interviewed that one physician right. to stop that yep. the injury. That's a whole program so. to uh, encourage that. Dr. Nowak, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just want to add a couple of things when we're talking about the knee specifically. Things that would be red flags that you'd also want to look out for. So if you have a lot of swelling in the knee, that typically indicates that there may be something more serious going on, as well as complaint mechanical symptoms such as like locking, catching, popping. Um, those associated with pain would be reasons to have um, a formal evaluation by a physician. Shannon, on the, on, on, with the question, do you have any other questions? Was that uh, specific um, answers? Well, as, as we're rolling into the basketball season, I see a lot of the older boys wearing the patella strap, <laughs> so just below the knee. Um, it's like a little neoprene wrap. Does that provide any sort of uh, benefit as far as, um, I don't know, pressure off the knee, alleviating, helping any of the pain in the knee? You want to take that, Doug? You, sure. you have. Yeah. So they have been shown in certain conditions that could be helpful. It did, I think one of the problems with those straps is they're used as like a, a cure-off for all knee problems. For a specific problem, some of the patellar tendonitis, they can help some people, um, but I wouldn't really recommend just putting that on um, haphazard without actually being evaluated by a physician to make sure you're actually treating the appropriate 
condition for that. Okay. The other thing, Shannon, um, is that no brace uh, works as good as conditioning, the proper strength training, um, making sure that your um, young man is, is ready for playing that sport and conditioned. And that's so much more important than going out and buying him a, a brace. Okay. Very that's good. a good point, Clay. That's a good point. Shannon, thanks for your call. Uh-huh. Thank you. Let's talk about the knee as long as we're talking about knees. Um, what, you know, speaking of, of uh, what we were just talking about, I had my knee replaced. Is, is it changed over the years where, you know, I was, they had me up and walking like, you know, that 20 minutes after I pretty much had knee surgery. You know what I mean? Is that, is that different than it was, say, five years ago, you know, up and moving around? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that we're, all of us, in all of our respective um, fields, especially within orthopedics, have kind of gained an appreciation for early motion, uh, more aggressive rehab. Uh, bad things happen when you lay around. Your muscles right. atrophy, your hormones change, your biochemistry changes. So getting up and getting going is, is a good thing. Yeah, when, when they started doing hip replacements, they used to admit you to the hospital three days before the surgery. Right. Basically, you're on bed rest, and you're on bed rest for a couple of days after the surgery, and you'd stay in the hospital for like three weeks. Now, people go home two to three days afterwards, and we get them up and walking the next day or mm-hmm. the same day. So um, th- as far as the arthritis in the knee, what are the symptoms of somebody having arthritis, arthritic knee, the symptoms of that? I stumped them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a big big subject. I think, first of all, you should probably, for your audience, really define what is arthritis. Okay. There you go. Okay. And uh, arthritis basically is a catch-all term. It's like, what is car trouble? You know, it, there's a lot of stuff that uh, really causes arthritis, but the bottom line for arthritis is it's either, it's either the damage or destruction of that white pearly stuff that coats the end of the bone. Okay. And that can happen a lot of ways. Um, most of the time, it's because it wears out, um, you know, because we do something to it uh, and it wears out before we do, and that whole uh, breakdown of that white pearly stuff causes a very complex cascade of changes in the bone and in the joint that cause what we recognize as, you know, sore, creaky, stiff joints, arthritis. Yeah, yeah but why, why doesn't th- that joint reheal itself, rejuvenate? <clears throat> What's different about that tissue that it doesn't heal? And, and that's the reason it, it creates so, much, so many problems because it doesn't heal. One of the issues is the articular cartilage. Um, the white pearly stuff that Clay yeah, was talking it, about. It's barely even living tissue. It has very few cells, so it has very low metabolic activity. If you have a, a ding in it and you were to look at it even years later, you may see the same ding there if you were an adult, as opposed to if you cut yourself on the arm, well, a week later it would be healed up. A normal human joint has astonishingly low levels of friction, probably lower friction than virtually any man-made system. And... But if the cartilage becomes rough, it changes the characteristics of the fluid and the mechanical characteristics as well, and it does not have great capabilities for healing itself. And so like Clay was talking about that cascade of effects downhill, it just progresses to get worse? Yeah, something really weird happens once you stop growing. The cartilage, that white pearly stuff in your joint, it has a capacity to heal itself when you're growing, when you're young, when you're a child. It's dividing, it's multiplying. Right. And it's also making this miraculous material around it. You know, it's really, most of the cartilage is this material that's like super, super cool. I mean, it absorbs everything. It, it's super strong, super resilient. But the cells that make it, after you stop growing, uh, stop losing they lose the ability to divide and make more of that stuff and it's nobody knows i mean that's a great question if you could figure that answer like how to keep those cells going nobel prize time yeah absolutely yeah. that's yeah, when absolutely. you that's when you used to be able to get out of bed and not moan and and yeah. you, know, you just jump right. up and and good to go right but, but you know i mean great question that leads me into why are we injecting you guys let's talk about the synvisc um, let's talk about some of that injections that we're, we're that you're doing right now. And on the horizon, is there any kind of a? They're talking about a bacteria that will re- reproduce cells that they're going to inject in there. I mean, there's a lot of options out there. What's going on in that research? And this would be before replacement, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Synvis. Let's start with that injection. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I'll try that. You know, I I mentioned all the the cascade of changes, the complex changes that occur when that cartilage wears out. Well, one of the changes that occurs, and we don't really understand why, is the joint loses the capacity to make the gooey, sticky stuff that lubricates the joint. Your your joint has fluid in it that acts like uh, grease on the skids, and a component of that fluid is this synvis stuff, this hyaluronic acid. Well, for some reason, when people get arthritis, they don't make enough of it, and what they do make is kind of crummy. So the scientists kind of figured out uh, that this stuff exists. In basic research, they were just looking at what makes up joint fluid, what part of joint fluid doesn't cause inflammation, what happens if we inject this part into joints that have arthritis. Uh, let's do it in racehorses that are getting slower. Wow, man, when we did it in racehorses that are getting slower, they run faster. There must be something good about this stuff. Let's test it. That's what Synvis became. It's this gooey, sticky stuff, the component of joint fluid that lubricates the joint that you lose the capacity to make or you don't make much, as much of when you have arthritis. We can stick it in your knee, and it'll make your knee feel better if you have arthritis for a while. Is that the rooster combs? Is that what that yeah. is? Yeah. Okay. So what do you, personally, what are you seeing as results in your practice? Uh, I've been more or less favorably impressed. There's, like anything we do, there's a wide range of response. In certain people, it doesn't seem to do much. But in many cases, it's been very impressive. I have a number of patients who have had even six or eight cycles and had anywhere from you know, eight to 16 months of improvement, enough that they didn't need a knee replacement. Is that a cycle? Is that like not just one you have to sign up for the whole program? Is that Well, what I mean by that is if, yeah. you, if you give a series of injections, then you say, well, let's see if this works. Right. And if it's working effectively, then you say, well, come back when it stops working. And if it's long enough, you say, well, let's do it again. If they come back in your office in six or eight weeks, you say, well, it's not, it's not likely to work again. It wasn't that effective. But if they return to your office in, you know, 8, 10, 12 months or more, you say, well, gee, this wow. is a good thing. Let's do it the, again. The name of this stuff is hyaluronate acid or hyaluronate. And just like aspirin, you can buy Bayer, you can buy Bufferin, you can buy Excedrin. They're all aspirin. Well, Synvisc is a form of hyaluronic acid, but you can also have Synvisc, you can have Uflexa, you can have Hyalgan. There's a lot of drug companies out there that are making this stuff because there's a market for it, and it's useful. But the bottom line, it sounds like a reasonable option for that, you know, early worn-out knee that's not ready for a total joint. Or yeah, a, a, I think a it represents joint. progress. Yeah. What, you agree, Doug? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, Jeff? Yes, I agree. I mean, yeah. it's been a very effective temporizing measure. Okay, all right. Okay, we're, we've got to take a break. We're, as we, we're moving right along. Up, up next, we're going to talk about Dupree Trends Contracture. Of course, I know what that is. You're going to know what it is next on the Everbone Joint Roundtable on Health Matters on Fox Sports 1380. Okay, welcome back to... Uh, IRG, I forgot where we were. IRG Health Matters, uh, Maury Eskenazi, Shannon O'Kelly. It's the special Everett Bone and Joint Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable with Doctors Wertheimer, Barker, Pryor, Havener, Mason, and Nowak. We are uh, here. If you have a, if you have a fo- uh, question, you can give us a call at 425-304-1380. You can go to IRG's Facebook page. It's Facebook slash Integrated Rehabilitation Group. And you can also go to a great website. You can go to everboneandjoint.com. You can click on uh, a certain body part, and it'll take you to uh, to uh, shows we did talking about that body part. So if you're uh, questioning a, a surgery, you can go there. A great, a great website, everboneandjoint.com. Let's get into it. Now we're going to talk to Dupratins. Dupre- I screwed it up. Yeah. I Dupatrins. knew it off the air. Dupatrins. Dupatrins. Dupatrins contracture. What the heck does that mean, guys? Dupatrins is a, a contraction that develops uh, in uh, people of northern European heritage. So we call it the Viking disease. And um, it typically causes uh, nodules to form in the hand uh, that uh, usually go on to form uh, contractures where the fingers begin to slowly curl down. Uh, into almost a claw. It can be uh, quite disabling. It's more common in uh, men than women, uh, but again, it's it's more common in people of uh, Northern European heritage. It's high. Why is that? Why is that? Well, Northern you know, European heritage? initially, um, it's it's genetic. Uh, From rowing. No, it's not rowing. It, it, you say. You know, yeah, exactly. it's 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 actually an interesting disease to follow because uh, it's genetic in. Um, 
and how it's passed down, and it has uh, 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 its penetrance, which means how it expresses itself is not is somewhat variable. So not everybody who's of Northern European or Viking heritage gets it. But in the uh, when they follow where the Vikings have con- conquered uh, in Europe, those areas have higher percentages of uh, their population with the Dupuytrens. And it can be as high as 6% of uh, males in Norway uh, have Dupuytrens, and uh, I think it's uh, 3% or so of the women have it. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, very disabling. Um, but there's been lots of uh, breakthroughs recently that um, may make it so its uh, treatment uh, is improving. How do you know you might have Dupuytrens, or what are the early signs, and what are the telltale signs? The uh, the early signs are usually a, a nodule in the palm. Um, that nodule can be there for uh, you know kind of months to years and do nothing, and it's almost like a real thick callus. And then over time, that nodule uh, may uh, progress to a, a contracture, which almost looks like a uh, a cord or a tight band that goes along the finger and, and causes it to slowly curl up. And what are the treatments? Well, uh, treatments have have uh, changed over the years. Um, uh, for this, uh, you know, initially they used to do uh, quite aggressive surgery where they would at- remove sometimes all the skin and uh, the underlying uh, disease fascia. That doesn't, that doesn't sound very. Funny. No, you know. Uh, a lot of times there can be uh, nerve injuries and uh, further contractures from scar, infection, that sort of thing. Um, so one of the newer and uh, interesting treatments is a, a collagenase, which is an injection. It's an enzyme that can uh, be injected to actually kind of digest the abnormal cord and uh, make it so that you can straighten the finger out again. Todd, uh, these cords, aren't they a natural part of your palm? They sort of serve to hold that palm skin down firm uh, on your hand, but then they kind of change cell type when you get the Dupuytrens, isn't that right? Or? Well, the uh, sort of and sort of not. I mean, they follow natural ligaments within the hand, you know, so there's different kinds of um, ligaments that they tend to follow along. The cells are uh, normal fibroblasts, but they have a special component called the myofibroblast. So they, is, they almost start to turn into muscle. They cells, do. They're right? muscle, they're, they're muscle uh, scar tissue. You know, do the same sort of cells that uh, heal up your, your scrape on your knee are the fibroblasts. And in the hand, they just kind of run amok. And so they, they just become extra stiff and start to kind of bind down? Yep, over time. And, you know, and, and there's some relationships to smoking, uh, alcohol use, um, they sometimes say uh, uh, HIV has some sort of a connection, too. Well, um, and I, I've heard, uh, Todd, sometimes when you fix these, if you go and repair that, is there a chance that comes back? How do, you, how do you turn it off? How does the body just naturally turn it off? You know, you, there's nothing that we know of yet so far to be able to turn it off. So trauma is definitely something that I see in my practice quite a bit that seems to be something that sort of, uh, you know, makes it, be more progressive, more angry, sort of turns it on. Some, something with trauma brings it on. So, so is that why the recurrence rate is high too, Todd? Because you don't really ever get rid of those cells completely. They're yeah. still there, and you, so they can grow back. Those myofibroblasts, if, you know, there's no way you can get rid of all of them. That's why they used to try to do those radical fasciectomies and things to try to get rid of them. Uh, but with those cells remaining, they just tend to work their way back. Well, is there hope for a patient? I mean, when yeah, you see a patient that is, has, what, what you know, it, it, they're, they're, it usually is the ring and small finger, right? It's fourth and fifth fingers are yeah. the most common. In patients with diabetes, it's more uh, thumb and index, more okay. the radial oh, side really? of the hand. So w- when some guy comes to you and says, man, my, my fingers are, are really curled up, how do you decide what's curled up enough that you deserve treatment? And when you treat it, What's the likelihood that it's going to get straight and stay straight? You know, they, they call it the tabletop test. If you can uh, put your hand flat on a tabletop, then uh, you're good to go. Usually they say about 30 degrees is what we go by uh, for the uh, your big knuckles. And uh, even as little as 20 degrees uh, for the next knuckle down. The uh, So, so if, I can, if I can put my... 
uh, palm up and put my hand on the table with my palm up, and I can get my fingers all the way out straight. I don't have anything to worry You're about. You're good to go. Okay. Yeah. And it, when the cord, uh, when the contracture goes out towards the fingers more, you know, uh, they become more aggressive, more difficult to treat. Uh, my feeling is once they get into the fingers, you you definitely need to be evaluated because they usually progress rapidly. And, uh, and there's treatment that can prevent that progression. Sometimes patients will come in to see me, and uh, the finger's already at, you know, 90-degree contracture, and that's quite difficult to, to try to fix. So, so it usually begins in the palm, and then it goes out to the little fingers, I mean, to the little joints. Of to the, the tips, tips, yep. Starts okay. in the palm and works its way down. So the treatment option really boils down to cosmetics and function then I mean is that really why you're treating that then for the most part function yeah you know uh, patients always come in they can't put their hands in their pockets their fingers are always getting caught up you know sometimes patients will be like hey, just cut this thing off it's bothering me so much and that's when it's kind of gone on too long well at, what actually what you'll see with some of these people is in certain cases they will have a fairly mild case of the disease but they'll have a nodule in their palm that just gives them fits when they're trying to hold a tool or a racket or a golf club. And so occasionally you're trying to decide if you should be treating what is on the face of a, a fairly mild case more aggressively. I mean, I think 1,200 years ago if you had trouble holding your battle axe, but now it's more like... <laughs> more like your, so your, uh, can you inject them? Racket. I mean, how yeah, reliable is injection How compared to surgery? When do you decide to, to shoot them with an injection or operate on them? Well, um... There, so, like I said, there's the collagenase, and, um, you know, it's just out. Uh, the trade name is uh, Zyflex. Um, it's uh, been very optimistic in terms of its success rate. It's, uh, you know, about 80% improvement. So uh, what is that? Is that like meat tenderizer? Is that the stuff I put on my steak? Pretty much. Make it taste better? <laughs> just, just a little bit fancier and in a syringe uh, yeah, and sterile. Um but, you know, the, the downside to it, the Zyflex is it's very expensive, and uh, a lot of insurance companies um, don't fully cover it. I mean... That's the driver right there sometimes, yeah. isn't it? And, it, and so it, it may be, you know, a few more years before it's more widespread. Uh, the surgeries for, um, if, you know, if that's the route to go and the contractures at, you know, like I said, 30 degrees, is uh, less invasive these days. Uh, it's not a big, giant uh, Palmer... You know, remove all the skin and fascia. You know, uh, patients are uh, splinted just for a couple of days. They're working on motion right away and uh, and uh, usually have uh, good outcomes. Um, you know, nerve injury is always a consideration. Um, you know, that hasn't been my experience in, in my practice, but um, it's always... it's. <laughs> It's always something that can't happen. And, and the reason, you know, when you talk about the recurrence, anytime though you're doing revision surgery or it does come back, all your risks for nerve injury, artery injury, or just kind of poor outcomes uh, progress. So you try to wait almost as long as you can. Dupuytren's contracture. That's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, why do they call it Dupuytren's? Yeah, who's this Dupuytren guy? Why don't they call it condition with hand curled yeah. up. They call it the popple sign. You know, uh, Dupuytren was the, uh, I think he was the gentleman that first uh, described the disease process, so he got it. I still have a hard time spelling it. Sounds it. Like it's, <laughs> it sounds like we sh you should take to cure Dupuytren's contracture. A couple Dupuytren. A couple Dupuytren? <laughs> yeah, a couple, couple Dupuytren. <laughs> hey, you know, as long as we're all hanging out here, guys, um, we, uh, we, I have some emails people sent in. They had questions for you. Lisa wants to know, she has chronic golfer's elbow. And she wants to know, uh, she hasn't seen her doctor yet. Um, she wanted to know what she can do to uh, take care of that. That's a Havener question right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, golfer's elbow is somewhat similar to um, <clears throat> the Achilles tendinosis that Dr. Barker was talking about. Even the plantar fasciitis that we were talking about earlier, it's, again, it's a degeneration of the tendon. And it's one of those things that just takes uh, a long time to get better, there are lots of uh, good stretches that you can learn uh, from uh, therapy and things. Uh, eccentric strengthening is quite helpful. Uh, there can be things with, uh, you know, your your golf, uh, the grips and things that can be changed. Um, What's the difference between golfer's elbow and tennis elbow, and what is eccentric? I mean, I know you're eccentric, <laughs> but what is eccentric? Muscle uh, you know, eccentric. When you when a muscle contracts, uh, it likes to uh, shorten. And uh, when a joint uh, is or the muscle is contracting and the joint is moving 
in the same direction. That's called a concentric contraction. When you're lengthening the muscle uh, and so moving the joint kind of in the opposite direction that the muscle wants to move that joint, uh, that's called an eccentric contraction. So uh, same way like going down hills um, can be very difficult. Uh, you know, most hikers will find that going up is is pretty easy, but going down is, is actually pretty tough because going down is an eccentric contraction for your quads. Another way to think of eccentric contraction for those weightlifters is that your negative phase of the lift. That's a good point. So the golfer's elbow is essentially on the inside of the form, and then tennis elbow is on the top side. Yeah, on the lateral outside. Side, yeah. Lateral side, yeah. So when they're resting it, for a period of time, are they icing and ibuprofen? Yeah, you know the typical or Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> typical, uh, you know, ice uh, stretching is a huge, I think, part of uh, golfer's elbow. Um, Rehab, Shannon. Absolutely, physical I, therapy. I mean, I'm a physical therapist. Right. I think it helps. I mean, we yeah. we teach exercises, stretching, modification of activities. So that's a and good thing to come and see you if you have golfers. Uh, golfers yeah, golfers. Uh, all those uh, tendonitis and, uh-huh. and tendinosis. I mean, are, are difficult to treat. I think we'd all agree right here that they're difficult to treat. But um, sometimes, uh, you know, that type of intervention is helpful. Let yeah. me do a quick another one here for you. Okay. Uh, go ahead. No, I just, and specifically, if you are a golfer and you have a golfer's elbow, I thought Todd's point, make sure that your equipment yeah. is appropriately yeah, sized for your grips, hand and right. for your, and, and the other for thing your, just, yeah. your, your body size. You know, I just got new grips for my clubs, and you are you hit it right on the head. I mean, it's just kind of completely different, you know, the whole yeah. different feel I mean, of it. Just uh, as far as the epicondylitis or tennis elbow, I've seen a lot of patients over the years that have their rackets restrung, right. and all of a sudden they come in, and I didn't do anything. Well, are you sure? Yeah, I had my racket restrung. Changes the force and the tension on that racket. So, okay. Uh, Good question. Suki forty five asks. Uh, I think I might have a torn rotator cuff. Oh boy! Can a rotator cuff be healed or strengthened without surgery? Who wants uh, to handle that one? That's these. Uh, that's these uh, arthroscopy people. Yeah. Here. The rotator cuff, if it's if it's torn, that part of the tear will not heal. But rotator cuffs are fairly uh, fairly mysterious. Rotator cuff is a group of tendons that all of these muscles attach on the shoulder blade, and they come out and they attach on your upper arm, and they very much help uh, with certain rotational movements of the arm. But they also work effectively to sort of control some of the bigger motions in the shoulder, which is why if you have a large rotator cuff tear, sometimes people are completely unable to move their arm over their head or in certain directions. Small tears can sometimes be asymptomatic or they can be persistently painful, um, so it's possible if you have a smallish tear that's not a big enough to mechanically disrupt the function of the shoulder over a prolonged period of time, sometimes the irritation can subside. So a lot of times we rehabilitate people very aggressively prior to recommending surgery because the surgery is, is you know, time-consuming and difficult to recover from. So if there's a small cuff tear, it can get better. Um, and also when people have partial thickness tears or small tears, if the symptoms are worsening, it's usually a strong sign that the tear is enlarging and may not be effectively treated conservatively. Hmm. Well, it hasn't. I mean, just the question here, hasn't there been research that has shown cadavers, people that donate their body to science when they do this, I mean, dissection on their shoulders, a lot of them have rotator cuff tears and went through life with no problems? That's absolutely been shown. And furthermore, it's been shown that a substantial percentage of rotator cuff repairs uh, that are seem to be very effective, the patient's happy, the patient has restoration of function. Some of these people, they study years later, and they find that they have a new tear or the tear is recurred, and yet the patients in many cases are highly functional, having little or no symptomatology. So really, you get it fixed because nothing else works, or you get it fixed because it's bad enough, not just because there is or is not a tear right. or a partial thickness tear there. Good. Wow. Good stuff. Yeah. Learning stuff. Is this going to be on the test, I wonder? Yeah. Uh, circle C. Always circle C. Right. Stick around. Coming up next, we're talking torn labrums. You're listening to a special Everett Bone & Joint Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable on Integrated Rehabilitation Group Health Matters on Fox Sports 1380. Welcome back to Health Matters. It's the Everett Bone & Joint Orthopedic Surgeon Roundtable. Maury Eskenazi, Shannon O'Kelly. This is IRG Health Matters. We're going to talk about uh, the torn. We're going to talk about labrum tears, right? But first of all, let's go to the phone. Heidi from Everett is on the phone. Heidi, are you there? 
I'm here. All right, go ahead. Ask your question. I have um, arthritis in my big toe, and I want to know what I should do about it. All right. Dr. Barker? That's pretty much uh, my area here. So big toe arthritis, otherwise known as hallux rigidus, can is bad, but it can be cured, and there's a couple different ways. The easiest to start with is a shoe stiffener, and maybe even a mountaineering boot might help you. If that doesn't, then there's several surgeries that can help depending on what kind of toe arthritis. Uh, don't get a toe joint. Don't get a joint put in because they don't work. So that's the short and sweet answer to big toe arthritis. So hang on, what do you mean? I mean, are they are they doing these artificial toe joints these days? They have been for a long time, and they don't really work. Okay, and why don't they work? I mean, it's just a bad, bad product. Bad. I mean, the reason it's, is it's too hard to control that joint, and it's much. The outcomes are much much better. See, I, I feel responsible for this too, just from selling yeah, bad shoe fitting guy, shoes. Yeah, bad shoes for twenty five years. Yeah. You know what people don't realize? I think we should talk about the pressure on the big toe or the first ray. Just when you roll over and push off, I mean, it sustains. A lot of force down through that first ray. Is that right? It does. And people who have big toe arthritis don't walk normally. They walk on the outside part of their foot. And after a fusion of their big toe, they don't walk normally, but they walk much better because they will roll off that big toe now. So are you recommending if, if the pain doesn't go away for this young lady and or and it just continues to be a problem and it's interfering with her life, is a fusion an option versus a, a, a joint replacement? It de- oh, definitely not a joint replacement. Okay. Okay. That's, I don't think that that is a surgical option with the literature that we have now. Those things deteriorate fairly rapidly, then you have huge problems. Howard, if Heidi is a young lady who uh, loves to play soccer or is, has, uh, and has a sore big toe, are you thinking that it's arthritis or could it be something else like turf toe? Yeah, it could be turf toe, which is a sprain of the bottom part of the toe, uh, and that is really a debilitating injury. I mean, people miss... they they're out with their careers. Deion Sanders ended his career because of turf toe. Jack Ham. Yeah. So you know, and, and so how do you, one, how do you treat it, and uh, is there any relationship with the kind of turf you're playing on? I mean, do athletes that play on artificial surfaces have more of a chance of getting turf toe than athletes that play on grass or natural surfaces? Uh, I think initially it was because the turf was so different. I don't think the literature shows that anymore, though. So the turf is better. So what do you do if you're an athlete and you want to play, you know, high school football kid comes in and goes, Guy, my big toe is killing me. I'm going to be able to start this year. It's my varsity season and my senior year. What do you do to treat him? Well, it's a problem trying to get him back quickly. I mean, even in the NFL where we throw everything at him, sometimes turf toe requires surgery where we repair the plantar plate. But that recovery is season-ending, basically. What's uh, the plantar plate? The plantar plate is, sorry, is the ligaments underneath the, the big toe trying to hold the joint together. So, Heidi, are you, are you sure you have arthritis, or what are your symptoms? Uh, it aches a lot when I walk around at night when I'm sleeping. It's stiff. So the stiffness is probably, you know, due to, could be from the plantar plate, but most of the time it's due to an arthritic condition and, you know, it, take, it wouldn't take too long to figure it out on an exam and with an x-ray to depend on what it is. Uh, rarely you'd need something like an MRI, uh, but most of the time these are fairly treatable, especially with the uh, with arthritis. Great. Okay. Heidi, thanks for your call. Okay, so let's go to labrums. Um, Sue Bird from the Storm had surgery recently to repair a labrum tear in her, in her right hip. So... Uh, what uh, what does that mean? What is the what is a labrum? Who's who, is this you, yeah. so Dr. We're, Nowak? So we're we talking about the hip. Uh, this right. Is what we're talking about. Yeah. There's labrum in the shoulder. There's also labrum in the hip. So let's just start about the anatomy of the hip. The hip is a ball and socket joint. The acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis, is the socket. Then you have your femoral head, which is your thigh bone, is the ball. Around the socket is a rim of fibrocartilage. Think of it like a bumper of soft tissue, that basically helps to deepen the socket provides some stability, and there's nerve fibers that go to that labrum, so when it's torn, it can be very painful, or it could also cause some mechanical symptoms such as locking, catching, popping. Um, you'll see, you know, there's increased, let's say, diagnosis and recognition of labral tears um, over the past probably five or ten years. The so-called hip pointer, which, which do still occur, but 
frequently hip pointers and whoever, or these label tears are previously diagnosed as hip pointers or groin strains um, were in fact label tears and we just didn't really understand that. And you don't really hear hip pointer that much anymore. That was a big football injury back in the day, but that's what it is. It's a labral tear? Well, not always. I mean, there is a, truly is a hip pointer. Well, what, um, you, like what, what you're saying is those labral tears were there possibly, but yes. now you're diagnosing them better. Right, the right. The technology yeah. has allowed you to diagnose them a little bit more effectively? Exactly. I don't think that they're actually increasing. Like, there's more label tears now than there was 10 years ago. I think we're just we're recognizing them more now. And with the awareness and then ex looking for them on exam as well as MRI, we're seeing them, and now we have new ways to treat them. And not too many people out there in the world of orthopedics are able to scope these hips or do arthroscopy procedures of the hips and, I mean, I think you and I, Doug, were talking off air, and this is part of what you did in your training. And w what is the treatment for a labral tear in the hip particularly? Correct. Well, just like a rotator cuff, you know, not all labral tears in the hip are symptomatic. Not all of them really require treatment. Um, but if you have, you know, persistent pain um, or mechanical symptoms despite treatment, including physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, then you could go on to have um, the hip arthroscopy. Um, I trained with uh, Dr. Mark Philippon. He's actually the one that did Sue Bird surgery as well as uh, Lauren Jackson, Sydney Rice. I'm just measuring, mentioning some of the Seattle pro athletes um, that I've had in the last year. So what Sydney had a turn labor in there? Sydney mm -hmm. Rice? Okay. A-Rod. Yeah. A-Rod yeah. had, had it too, yeah. Right. That's yeah. right. A-Rod was big. Yeah. A lot of hockey goalies and, and, and skaters, I mean, soccer players, <clears throat> people right. with a lot of little motions in their legs. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. like Mari Lemieux and some golfers, Greg Norman, they've all had... Doug, do you think that by repairing the labrum, you're helping people um, preventing maybe arthritis down the line? Is there any evidence or proof that that might be the case? There's not direct proof saying that by doing this surgery we prevent arthritis. However, what we do know is that there are certain conditions, um, called a condition called thermosetabular impingement, which basically means the the bones of the hip joint are impinging on each other. Um, there was some research in Scandinavia that looked at 80% of the people that ended up having hip replacements had femoral acetabular impingement on x-rays. So, hey, Doug, are you, are you born with that? Is that just the way you're born anatomically, uh, with femoral acetabular impingement? Uh, it, it's a combination. There's definitely a genetic predisposition, uh, predisposition, but in addition, there's activity related, too. It's not something that you have when you're one years old, but you definitely see a family predilection for it. And then certain activities, particularly hockey, as Shannon mentioned before, we see it very, very commonly just because of all the, the pivoting and the lateral like push-off to the side movements in skating. Here we get a phone call. Uh, let's go to Colleen and Ever. Colleen, are you there? Hello? Colleen? Hello, Colleen? Yes. All right, go ahead. Um, I actually had a hip replacement about a year and a half ago, a Birmingham hip, and I'm doing very well. But my question is, if um, if I had a, a labrum tear and a repair done, would that have solved my problem? And not, and you know, down the line, do they expect maybe that you won't have as many hip replacement surgeries if they have a a repair of the labrum tear? Let's take a look at her X-ray, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you have it there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're amazing. <laughs> Just Google you. So to expand on what I was saying before, it's, you know, most people that hip re have hip replacements have their mastitis impingement. They have the bones impinging on each other. And what happens is the labrum gets squeezed in between those bones. Eventually, it then starts to shear off the cartilage in the hip, and it goes on to arthritis. That has been shown. So we believe that if we get rid of the impingement, which means we actually shave down the bones so they're no longer impinging each other, in addition to repairing the labrum. It's not just fixing the labrum. There's several things that are done at the same time, that if we get rid of the impingement, fix the labrum, um, correct the dynamics of the hip joint, that we will slow down the progression of arthritis or possibly halt it. That We haven't proven that yet, so I can't say that conclusively we do that with surgery because we've only been doing hip scopes for about 10 years. We need to have longer-term follow-up on our patients. So theoretically... The answer to your question would be yes, but I can't um, back that up with research at this yeah, point. Yeah, remember what we were saying earlier, too. There's yeah. lots of causes of arthritis, Colleen. I mean, it's possible that your arthritis, your premature early wear and tear, that white pearly stuff that coated your ball and socket, 
was because maybe you had an injury or a blow to it directly when you were young and that caused premature aging. It may be that you have rheumatoid arthritis, an actual autoimmune disease where your body recognizes a part of the joint as foreign and attacks it uh, and creates the destruction of the uh, cartilage. So there's lots of reasons why you get arthritis and lots of various conditions and diseases. But one of them may be this um, femoral acetabular impingement. And if you had had that when you were young, yeah, maybe the case that had that um, hip arthroscopy been available to you and you had a competent guy like Doug do a hip arthroscopy on your hip and change the shape of the ball so it didn't bump into the socket, then the cartilage wouldn't have broken down so soon. However, by the time you need a joint, that horse has left the barn. Right, yeah. yeah. By the time the cartilage is worn out, it's too late for a hip Yeah, hey, As we go to commercial, just real quick, what are some early signs of hip problems to look for? Uh, so pain deep in the groin, um, popping, catching deep in the groin. Okay, fine. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your call. You know, we're we're uh, this is it. We're we're done. It's uh, it went by really quick. We could probably go four hours. These guys are these guys are fantastic. We want to thank uh, every bone and joint. You guys are great. Doctor Wertheimer, Barker, Pryor, Havener, Mason, and Nowak. And you know what, Doctor Haller, Kinahan, and Bill Huang, all the doctors. Your fan, your guys are great. And uh, for more information. Go to everbonejoint.com, first class organization. I, I can tell you, I had my knee replaced with you guys, and uh, I'm walking to tell about it right now.